Thank you for listening to a Christ-centered message from Grace Community Church. We are committed to proclaiming the authority of God's Word without apology and trust that you will receive encouragement as we study today's passage together. Matthew chapter 7 will be in verses 24 through 27 this morning. Here we are. We are in the fourth warning today as Jesus is closing this sermon out. The first warning he gave us is beware of the way you choose. There's two ways. You're on one way or the other this morning. You're either on the wide way that leads to destruction. Lots of people on that way. It's very populated. Or you're on the narrow way. And that leads to life. The second warning that Jesus gave was beware of false prophets. There are false teachers who stand at the entrance of the narrow way and they stand all along the way saying, come on, you don't have to stay on this. This is too difficult. It's too extreme. Uh, This is what Jesus really meant. And they try to change and edit and reduce and obscure his message. The third warning that Jesus delivered in his conclusion is beware of the false conversion that there are two followers on the way. They say, oh, I'm a follower of Jesus, and they do all kinds of things in Jesus' name, and yet the day is coming when Jesus will declare to them, although you used my name, I never gave you my name. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Today we come to the fourth warning, and the reality is this, that whether Jesus that day as he was preaching or any preacher since, the preacher lays out, there are, there are two choices before you, there are two options before you, but no preacher, no teacher, no parent can choose for you and make you go the right way. By the grace of God, I pray that I live a life that leads people to walk in the right way. We gathered as men yesterday morning in our men's Bible study looking at who are those in the church that the Lord has objectively called, what are their standards to lead? There is no perfect person, man, woman, parent, pastor. But let me ask you this question, what drives your decision-making process? You have a worldview this morning. I have a worldview this morning. How do we get to that worldview? It'll come on the screen. What one commentator gave that is helpful, dividing it into four, down to four pillars or four choices of how you make your worldview. Some people will develop their worldview based on reason. Well, I think, I think this. I think this is important. Their thoughts and and their own opinion. Other people will say, well, here's my experience. I feel this way. I feel this. This approach is becoming more and more popular, especially as it is being said right now, with the critical race theory, your experience trumps the final, and that's revelation. Revelation. That you can't, yes, God's word is important, but your experience has become more important than God's word. Tradition, well, this is what we've always done. This is what my grandparents did. This is the tradition I was brought in. Whatever that tradition is, whatever continent you are on, well, we've always done it this way. Tradition. There's a fourth way to develop a worldview, and that's revelation, God says in his word. So this is very different when you're discussing with someone and you're saying, hey, what do you think about, and just put the topic on the table, and you will hear how that person comes to a worldview. Well, I think, well, I just feel that, well, you know, in my experience, but then someone will say what Dr. Sewell, who is now in heaven, used to tell all of his, you know, when anybody asked a question in Bible college, he would say, book, chapter, verse. What's he pointing to? What was he pointing to? Revelation. 
But I feel, show me the book, chapter, and verse that supports what you are believing. Well, I think, show me the book, chapter, and verse. Well, my experience, show me the book, chapter, and verse. Because book, chapter, and verse is the only thing that will stand the test of time and eternity. That's it. Well, my pastor said, show me the book, chapter, and verse. And there you will get to quickly, whether it's a preference or it's scripture, objective truth. We all have a worldview. And these worldviews are all over the map in the day that we live. Let's just... There's a picture that'll come on the screen. We were here a couple weekends. I guess it was last week. It seems like a long time ago since we were here at the Ark. There's a picture. Now, I don't know what happened. The, the gentleman that was so kind to take our group picture, he missed the Ark, loved ones. <laughs> I mean, I had it all set. I took that picture, and then I handed it over, and I said, here, and I didn't move, and I left him the phone, and he got there and like, ooh, this group is really important. Let me zoom in on the group. Like, we know who we are. We came to the ark. The, the, the whole thing, you know? So anyway, that's, that's the whole picture. The, this whole sermon is just geared around to get that picture up there. But that is a picture of a sermon, of God's salvation. That his salvation is not dinky and small and limited. But as Noah was preparing that, that sermon that rescue vessel, probably about 70 years, he was 500 when he became a father, 600 when they got on the ark, probably had help. People probably helped build that sermon of salvation. And so many people, and here was the two options, get in through the door, the one and only door, or stay outside and trust your thoughts, feelings, and experiences, or the revelation of God. You have, you have two options, really. Trust you or trust in the word of the Lord. And only Noah and his wife and his two sons and their wives made it on that, on that rescue vessel. Listen, listen. Hebrews 11, verse 7, this is what the writer says about Noah. By faith, Noah being warned by God, warning, Concerning events as yet unseen, unfathomable, can't believe this, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of, righteous, of the righteousness that comes by, what's the word? Faith. You want me to do what, Lord? Build what? Why? He, he had no human reason, thought, feeling, or experience to say, all right, this is a really good idea. It was his only hope. Moses would come later in time, and he heard, and he obeyed the call of God, and then he extended that call to Israel to hear the salvation of God, to follow him. Hebrews 11, verse 24, by faith Moses when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Here's your option. Be identified with Pharaoh and his family in Egypt and all this earthly power, or be identified with God and his people. There's two options for you, Moses. Choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the, here's the key word here, fleeting pleasures of sin. You know the Bible doesn't lie about sin. Sin is fun. I'll be honest with you, sin is fun. Sin is a blast until you're done with whatever that act of sin is. And then comes all the harvest. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt. For he was looking to the reward. Verse 27, by faith he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king. For he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. By faith the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. You have two choices. And there were Egyptians that left with the Israelites. They converted and left with them. 
different than the army chasing after, saying, okay, never mind, we are going to take you back. No, you're not. Listen to what Moses says in his, some of his final words to the people of God, the Israelites. Deuteronomy 30 in verse 14, he says, but the word is very near you. And I can say the same to you this morning, to all who are listening. If you're joining online, whenever you hear this message, you listen to it on a podcast, you listen to it on our webpage, you listen uh, through YouTube. However you hear the message, the word is very near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart so that you can do this. You can do it. Verse 15, see, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. You see the two, two ways, two options? If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you today by loving the Lord your God, by walking in his ways and by keeping his commandments and his statutes and his rules, then you shall live and multiply and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. But there's another way. If your heart turns away and you will not hear, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are going over the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have done my job. I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, what does he say to do? Choose life. That you and, this is gonna affect your, your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren, that you and your offspring may live. Live how, Moses? Loving the Lord your God obeying his voice and holding fast to him. Why would we do that, Moses? For he is your life and length of days that you may dwell in the land that your, the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob to give them. He keeps his word. Well, then James, the half-brother of Jesus, he contrasts the two types of wisdom because everybody watching Noah build the boat, they had an option, divine wisdom or my own human wisdom, my thoughts, feelings, experiences. You have the same, you, you have the same. You're dealing with the very same. You're no different than the hearers of Noah. You're no different than the hearers of Moses. We're no different. And James would write about the two different types of wisdom, James 3 and verse 13. And he says this, who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown by peace, in peace by those who make peace. Do you see what he is doing? He's saying there's two types of wisdom, and those two types of wisdom are born out in the lives of people. Those people bear fruit. Jealousy, bitterness, fighting, that's not wisdom from above. Self-seeking, wisdom from above is pure and peaceable and easy to be entreated. It's, it plays out in our lives. So you, we have to ask the question. This isn't just for you. We have to ask ourselves the questions, what wisdom am I operating with? Which way am I on? Which teacher am I listening to? And then you have to apply this to me. You have to take this standard. Remember, we started these with the straight line by hand, free hand, and you contrast that with a straight edge. So what your responsibility as hearers is today is you have to say, is my pastor, is this preacher in line, in step 
with Scripture, God's revelation, or is he out of step? Is he out of line? Is he doing his own thing, or is he bringing to us God's thing? That is every message that you hear, book, chapter, and verse. Prove it. I don't care who your daddy is or what your resume is or how many stories you can tell or how many people follow you or how many books you've published. Book, chapter, and verse. That's the only thing that will bear up the weight of our souls is the word of God, God's revelation. And your response will be directly tied to how you view Scripture. And some will be drawn in and say, thank you, God, for putting me in a place where you you give me your word. Others will say, I don't really like that message. I don't think that message is blah, 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 blah. I don't feel that he should have said that. You know, in my experience, and right there you divide the two types of wisdom. Matthew. Chapter 7, verse 24. Everyone then who hears these words of mine, and what's the key here? Does them. Will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock, and the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall. Because it had been founded on the rock, And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. This is the word of the Lord. Warning number four, our fourth and final warning in Jesus' sermon. Beware of a faulty foundation. You have a foundation this morning. You are building your life on something. Will it bear up the weight of your soul in judgment? That's the question that we all have to ask. We have to ask of ourselves. So Jesus gives to us now two builders. That's the the title of the message. There's two builders. They're building two houses. The houses look the same. You know, when when I was a kid, I thought this was like, here are the the spiritual people, and then there's the, the worldly, wicked people, and they're building on sand. That's not what Jesus is talking about here. He's talking about two religious people, and they're building a religious life. Both look kind of the same. They have impact the people around them. They, they sing the same songs. They do the Bible studies. They do the things. They are doing things in the name of Jesus, but there's something radically different about these two builders. First of all, we see the wise builder. The wise builder, and this builder builds his life on Christ. And who is Jesus? He's the solid rock. On Christ the solid rock I stand, right? All other ground is what? Sinking sand, okay? So it's only Christ who is the solid rock. Isaiah 28 and verse 16, therefore thus says the Lord God, behold, I am the one who has laid a foundation in Zion, a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone of a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not be in haste. So then Paul says in Ephesians 2 and verse 19, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Remember, he's writing to Gentiles. What right did we have in Israel? Well, what does that do when you take Gentiles and Jews and you bring them together into this family? Verse 20, we're built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself, not Peter, being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Do you think that God cares about how his people interact with one another when we are being built on Christ? The wise builder is building his life on Christ 
the solid rock. This is God's doing. He hears the words of Jesus, is what Jesus says. He mentioned this two times. He hears the words of mine. He says that of the wise builder. He says that of the foolish builder. He, letter A, hears the words of Jesus. Oh, I heard that message. Did you hear what Jesus said? I heard what Jesus said. Wasn't that, a, wasn't that a great message? Wasn't that an amazing message? Do not take for granted, beloved, the blessing of having the word of God in our possession. Do you realize we don't? We do not. I'll just answer the question for all of us. We don't realize the sacrifice that men paid and women with their lives for us to have God's word in our possession today and how, how little we really appreciate the word of God as we should that you have a copy, you have access to the word of God. The word of God cuts us because he's holy, his word is holy, but his word also cleanses us and shows us the way to live. Do you realize there is a great blessing in hearing the word of the Lord? Amos warned about a a famine, the deadliest famine known to man. Amos chapter 8, verse 11, he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Do you know how many people... Tell me so often I was looking for a church that would just simply open the word. Do you know that's in the founding documents of this church? A return to the faithful preaching of the word. That's in the founding documents, in the DNA of this church. That is number one in who we are, our distinctives. Christ-centered, unapologetic preaching. May God help us to always hold to that because as soon as we opt for a different message, we have outdated, done, expiration date. The apostle Paul, he says, well, if there's a famine, Romans 10 verse 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Have you called on the name of the Lord? And he follows that up with a question, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? That question comes up in Bible studies. Well, pastor, what about the people who've never heard? Are they responsible for their sin before God who made them? Answer, yes. And we are responsible to bring them the message of salvation. That's the Great Commission. And how are they to hear? Paul asked this question without someone preaching. And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the, are the feet of those who preach the good news. Can I ask you this morning, do you have beautiful feet? Have you brought to anyone the good news? When was the last time you told someone that God, the God who made them and loves them, came and lived the life they could never live and went to the cross that they deserve, that you deserve, that I deserve, and he died in our place. He was buried and he rose again so that everyone who turns from their sin and trusts in him alone will be given life that never ends. When was the last time we shared that with anybody? Well, this man hears the word of Jesus and then this man does the will of Jesus. See, it's one thing to hear Oh, I heard that. Yeah, I know you heard me, but you didn't respond. You're still sitting there. I asked you to do something. You're still sitting there. It's one thing to hear what Jesus says. It's another thing entirely to do what he commands. Now, this is a hard command. This is humanly impossible to do what Jesus says to do. You can't do it without the Holy Spirit. In Revelation 1.3, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear and who, here's the key word, keep what is written in it for the time is near. So reading, hearing, but where is the blessing experienced? In keeping it, in obeying it. James 1, we've referred to this a couple of times. Again, the first sermon I ever preached is this text right here. 
Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. So there's, there's something going on there that we actually have to purify our minds, we have to cleanse our minds, we have to prepare our minds as we come to worship or when we're in worship, we are too tired to stay awake, we're too distracted with everything else, We are not prepared to hear and receive the word of God. It goes right over our heads because we're thinking about, well, what am I going to do this afternoon? And what am I going to do this week? And what about the economy? And what about this? And what about the other? And you can fill it up. And the word just seems like blah, 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 blah. That's why I encourage you. That's why we print the notes. That's why you need your Bible open so that your mind is engaged, your hand is engaged, your heart is engaged. Why? Because it takes that much. Say, God, burn this on my heart. Burn this on my heart. Let this bear fruit in my life. Be doers of the word and not hearers only. Deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror. Oh, that was a great message. Jesus, that was a great message. Oh, Brian, that was a great, I really appreciate that message. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. Oh, what's for lunch? What are we doing? What's tonight? What's later? What's this? What's that? Verse 25, here's the difference now. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Where is the blessing? In the obeying of the word. So this man, the wise builder, he hears the word. He does the will of Jesus. And he encounters extreme storms. Rain fell, floods came, winds blew, beat on that house. These are extreme storms. Beloved, the children of God, we're talking about Christians, are not exempt from suffering. This is Christianity 101. That if you think, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trust in Christ and my marriage will get better and, and my parenting will get better and my children will start and, and, and things will, my, my job will get better. And there's a lot of people trying to sell that message. You just don't have a book and chapter and verse for it. Let's not forget we followed a crucified Savior. And it wasn't because he did anything wrong. Sometimes that happens when you lose a job or your health tanks and you think, what did I do and what am I not doing and what should I be doing? Read your Bible. Read the Psalms. Look at how people have suffered in our history. The children of God are actually guaranteed suffering. So Peter would write and he would encourage the believers who were facing trials and suffering, 1 Peter 5, 10. And he says, and after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal to, in glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Do you hear what Peter's doing there? He's not ignoring the suffering, but he is diminishing the suffering. Oh, after you have suffered, that's a strong word, for a little while. Here's what's coming. Your father, your good father in heaven, he will right all wrongs. And he will, do you see the end of it? Himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. What is that? God saying, your father, I've got this. Trust me. Do what I've said to do. Trust and obey. Paul experienced trials, suffering. He encouraged the church to remain steadfast in Christ. Where's your anchor? Well, he's appealing that you need to anchor in revelation, anchor in truth, anchor your lives in the word of God. 2 Timothy 3.10 Speaking to Timothy, writing to Timothy, you, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my, here it is, persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet, he's doing the same thing Peter did, 
I mean, is this what our prayer meetings sound like? Oh, man, pray for me, my back, oh, my knee, oh, my, my this situs and that situs, oh, oh, pray for me and fill up the prayer list full of. And Paul has been beaten, shipwrecked, persecuted everywhere he goes. And he says, but now enough about that. But I need you to know that's coming, Timothy, so I'm not going to lie to you. But enough about this life. This life is transient. This life is temporary. This life is passing, Timothy. So he goes on from there and he says, I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being, being deceived, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Timothy, but as for you, build your life on what is true. You see, there's no lies there. Paul's not saying, come to Jesus and your life will get better, easier, smoother. No. People will treat you. People will flock to you. No, they won't. That's not what we're promised. Jesus doesn't promise that. So the wise builder does encounter extreme storms. Did you all hear that? I don't want you to miss that. If you're in Christ, you will suffer. So don't be surprised when you suffer. Where did this come from? Why did this happen to me? I was even singing last Sunday. You know, or whatever else we put. I gave in the offering. I gave to the building. And this happened and that happened. And we start doing those calculations. Go back to the Bible. Go back to Revelation. Go back to Scripture. Letter D this wise builder, here's the difference, will stand strong because of Jesus. This builder's house will not be destroyed by trials or what Jesus really has in mind here is the coming day of judgment. But it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. You realize to build your life on Christ is not an easy life. That's why it's a narrow gate because you can't bring all of your experiences, all of your thoughts, I think this and I think that, I feel this and I feel that, and the straight, strict, narrow gate says, you can keep all of your thoughts and your feelings and your experiences, but unless you abandon all of that and receive the revelation of God, you will not be saved. Either you save you from a holy God or God saves you from a holy God. Spoiler. Who can redeem their own soul? It's too expensive. The price is too high. You have to bleed sinless blood. And that only happened one time. And we'll commemorate that today again. It's the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all sin. This house will stand strong. There's a picture that'll come on the screen of a house, a house that uh, withstood Hurricane Michael. Mexico Beach in Florida, 2018. Top winds, 162 miles an hour. Listen to an article that accompanied this, talking about the structure. A retired Miami-Dade building chief. That's his house. His name is Charlie Danger. He said, when I saw, yeah, fitting name, right? 
When I saw this hurricane's wind speeds, I knew you could only hope there would not be too many fatalities. Do you hear what he didn't say? I hope my house stands. Here's why. They built this house. Dr. Lackey said he and Mr. King, who jointly owned the Mexico Beach House, did not even refer to the minimum wind resistance required in Bay County. They built the sand palace to withstand, listen, ready? 250 mile an hour winds. What did I say a minute ago? The winds were 162. He's like, we're good. I'll watch it, but we built for 250. 160, we still have some room in the threshold there. The house was fashioned from poured concrete reinforced by steel cables and rebar with additional concrete bolstering the corners of the house. Dr. Lackey said this, we were thinking that we need to build a house that would survive for generations. And when that storm blew through, the foundation and the connection of that house to the foundation you can see it made a difference. It even made a difference for the house behind it. Like, ooh, my life is blessed because I'm near that person built on a strong foundation. Does anybody say that about you, whether they know Christ or not? Just by being your neighbor, they're experiencing the blessing of God because you live near them. Think about this. The children of God will be victorious because Jesus is overcome. He's our victory and we are his. John 16 and verse 33 says this, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Take heart, I've overcome the world. Here's the end of the story. The people of God overcome, we win, we're victorious. Not because of us, but because of Christ. John the Apostle was so convinced of our ultimate victory in Christ that he would write to his loved ones, 1 John 4, 4, little children, you are from God and have overcome them for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. 1 John 5, 4, for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world and this is the victory that has overcome the world. What is it? What is it? Our faith. 1 John 5, 5, who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? It's not just faith in faith. It's faith in Christ. Do you have faith in Christ? Are you building your life on Christ? And Revelation 12, 11 says, and they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they, listen to this now, they loved not their lives even unto death. Can we, can we say that? Their number one goal was not to stay alive. Their number one goal was to glorify the Lamb. Period. Well, what does this look like? Let me share with you the testimony of a man named William Borden, a millionaire from Chicago. His family, Borden Milk. Millionaire when he went to college. Graduated out of high school. He went to Yale, graduated from Yale, went on to Princeton, graduated from Princeton. Listen to what was said about this man. He went to, he went to school and everybody recognized there was something different about him. He began a prayer group with one other person at Yale in his freshman year. By the end of his senior year, there's over a thousand that would gather weekly to pray. They just knew there was something different about this guy. And it wasn't that he was rich. He would do whatever. They would make a list. He would make a list in his prayer time. Who are the incorrigible people on this campus? Who are the tough nuts? Who are the, the rascals, the difficult ones, the hard to reach? Give them to me. And he would go after them. And he would go after people in slums. And he, his life was just always outward. It was just radical, and everybody understood this. And when he graduated, he turned down the opportunity. He didn't go back to work with his family fortune. Instead, he was burdened for the Muslim people in China, a specific group. And he stopped off in Cairo, Egypt, after he graduated from Princeton. He stopped off because he needed to learn Arabic, and that's where he contracted spinal meningitis, and he died at age 25. 
And everyone would say, what a waste, but not him. This is what they found written in his Bible. Written in his Bible in three different places, no reserves, or, or three different phrases in different times, no reserves, no retreat, and no regret. Does that sound easy? No. It cost him his life. He didn't even get to the target where he was going. And yet, when other people were influenced by him, his turning away from everything that was in this life, they were moved. Doesn't that sound like another testimony that I've shared with you from time to time of Jim Elliot, what they found in his Bible? He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Do you think William Borden was foolish? He would disagree with you in the presence of God today. It's no fool who gives what he cannot keep. Well, he can't keep the money anyway. It's money. It's all from God. It's all God's. Oh, may these individuals impress upon our, our minds and our lives. Jim Elliott slain in the jungles of Ecuador. Young age, what a, what a waste. Not by eternity's standard. And we can't measure anything without the revelation of God rightly. We won't get there by our thoughts and experiences and feelings. Well, the wise builder, he builds his life on Christ. That's a solid rock. But there's another builder, and it's the foolish builder. Foolish builder builds his life on sinking sand, the sinking sand of man's opinion. Well, I think, I feel, oh, my experience is, and everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand, and the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Well, the foolish builder, just like the wise builder, hears the words of Jesus. He's just like the other builder in this regard. He might even have taken notes. He might have memorized. He hears, he appreciates, he respects, he studies, he memorizes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, the words of Jesus. But there's something radically different about this builder. He hears the words of Jesus, but he does not do the will of Jesus. That's what Jesus says. He doesn't do them. He doesn't obey. He hears it, and it goes in one ear and out the other, and then he goes back to his life. How many people are like that on Sundays, on a day of worship, and they hear the message, and it goes in and out and back to life as usual? That's not God's plan, loved ones. We're to be changed, forever changed by the word of God. At first glance, the words of Jesus are remarkable to this hearer. Like, oh, that's so impressive. That's amazing. I just, I'm going to have to get that. Um, um, give me that transcript of that message, Jesus. On further observation, the words of Jesus become optional to this builder. Like, well, I might try to do that. Then he considers the words of Jesus a little more, and then he begins to find issues that he has, and so he begins to de debate over the words of Jesus. And at last, this builder just discards the words of Jesus altogether. Eh, anyway, back to my life, back to what I do, back to what I know, back to what I think. That's a foolish builder. Often, this type of person it moves from apathy. Sometimes people are apathetic toward the word of God, eh, whatever. Sometimes it's angst. Social media is filled with these types of individuals today, brought up in the church, heard, memorized, even participated in teaching the word, and then they left, abandoned the faith. And there's angst now. There's hatred toward their upbringing. Both end up in the same place. It's a foolish builder. Letter C, this builder encounters overwhelming storms. Okay, believers, the wise builder, extreme storms. 
But for the foolish builder, there's something different. And, and the storms that come in life and ultimately in the judgment are overwhelming. It's too much. You can't handle it. The rain fell just like it did on the wise man's house. The floods came. The winds blew and beat against that house. Temptation comes along and it leads this builder to be shipwrecked. There's so many voices being added to the number of former pastors, church leaders that used to be saying a message like this, and now they're saying, never mind that, cancel that. People like Rob Bell, Joshua Harris, Abraham Piper, not for me anymore, and it's a popular word now, to be deconverted. The Bible says you were never converted And now you're simply doing what you have always wanted to do. And you've cast off all restraint revealing before everyone. You just scraped away all the sand around your foundation to see more sand. I think, I feel, well, my opinion, my my experiences. Sometimes it's trials and testing that can lead to apostasy by this type of hearer. Hears but does not respond and do. This is the stony ground hearer. They seem to have faith, but then tragedy comes or great blessing comes in their life. They get promoted, they get transferred, they get another position and things start going well and things of God are off in the distant way back I used to. It's not always bad things. Sometimes blessings can derail more people than difficult things, but we forget about that. Ultimately, the final judgment will reveal the true status of this type of person. There's an unbeliever. They heard the word, but they only heard. They refused to obey at all costs the word of God. Both builders face the same storms and appear to have the same structures, but sometimes trials that come in this life reveal different. Ultimately, final judgment, but there it's too late, will reveal you are not building on Christ. You are building on sand. It's easy to build on sand. The last time I preached this message was after a vacation Bible school. I pulled up, I pulled up the notes, 2009. We were outside at the property. Anybody remember this? And we had all of our kids with us. We were under a, a tent and I brought a drill and I brought sand and I brought a rock and some child of the church, I think I might remember who it was, but I, I'm, I may be uh, slipping in my memory. I gave them a drill to say, hey, while I'm preaching, you go ahead and, you know, you work on building something out of that boulder. And they were over there, you know, drilling and drilling and nothing was ever going to happen. They'd still be drilling and not into that rock. The sand, hey, you can build something quickly with that. But the first tide that comes in, it's gone. Jesus is using a beautiful analogy here. It's so clear. This foolish builder will be destroyed before Jesus. This is devastating. This builder's house will be destroyed by sometimes trials in this life, but ultimately, for sure, the day of judgment. And Jesus says, this house fell and great was the fall of it. This is devastation, right? That word there, destroyed, obliterated, gone. Nothing left of value. Just this year, June 24th, this year, 2021, we saw this happen, this collapse of the Champlain Towers down in Florida. Beachfront, 12-story condominium, Surfside, Florida. Some of you woke up, that was a Thursday morning, and you looked and you couldn't believe it. And the, the, the footage from the, somebody's security camera over here captures that tower falling. And it's like 98 people, their lives were lost. Many of them were probably just in their homes, one in the morning, sleeping, and they were carried away into the afterlife. They did not have that on their plan. They did not have that on their agenda. Perhaps you've seen the news this morning. There's a picture that'll come up of what's happened last night in Haiti, a 7.2 earthquake. Right now, there's over 300 people that they know of dead. 
Thousands are injured, and I'm sure they will find more. Why? Because the last, it's 10 years ago that the, the earthquake came through Haiti, and so many lives were lost because their, their building standards are not set to handle earthquakes. And, and, and you hear the words that Jesus says, and great was the fall of it. There's no one rejoicing over opportunities to rework the land. You're not looking at, well, this is actually, this is devastation. There's, there's pictures of people and their loved ones are gone. And they're sitting on a pile of rubble and everything that was their life is gone. And that's in this life, but they're alive. Loved ones are departed. And Jesus is saying, the one who builds on what I think, what I feel, and my experience, this is going to be what happens. This is a little glimpse of what your life will be in judgment. Devastated, destroyed. But, but I was a member of the church, but I did these things. I did those. But did you love God and obey his word? Oh, that we would hear this message as deep in our heart as we possibly can. Listen, in the Old Testament, warnings came. Don't, don't you think that in Haiti they would have liked to have a warning 24 hours in advance? Don't you think that in, in those towers down in Florida they would have liked to have a warning one day in advance? Tomorrow morning, this won't be here, so don't go in there tonight. And 98 people would be alive if they would have had the warning. So here's, what, here's my challenge to how you hear this. Would you even care if somebody came through and you lived in those towers or you were in Haiti and they came through an hour before at midnight, get out of the building, boom, 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 knocking on all the doors, get out of the building. I just don't appreciate the tone of that person. Would you say that? Not if you got out and you were standing outside when the building fell. Don't be like the guy on Mount St. Helens, the old timer that's like, I'm not leaving. 1980, I'm not moving. This is my house. And he went away with the lava into eternity. Never forget that guy. Don't know his name. But he was an old timer on that mountain. Jeremiah 23, verse 19. Behold the storm of the Lord. Wrath has gone forth, a whirling tempest. It will burst upon the head of the wicked. The anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has executed and accomplished the intents of his heart. In the latter days, you will understand it clearly. Jeremiah 25, 32, thus says the Lord of hosts, behold, disaster is going forth from nation to nation and a great tempest is stirring from the farthest parts of the earth. The prophet Ezekiel, Ezekiel 13, verse 10 the Lord is taking issue with, with his preachers, his prophets that are saying, oh, calm down. Let's just give a positive message and just, you know, encourage people and just tell them what they want to hear. This is how the Lord thinks about that type of a, a speaker in the name of God, Ezekiel 13, 10. Precisely, they have misled my people saying peace when there is no peace. And because when the people build a wall, these prophets smear it with whitewash, saying to those who smear it with whitewash that it shall fall. There will be a deluge of rain and you, O oh great hailstones, will fall and a stormy wind break out. And when the wall falls, will it not be said to you, where is the coating with which you smeared it? Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I will make a stormy wind break out in my wrath and there shall be a deluge of rain in my anger and great hailstones in wrath to make a full end. And I will break down the wall that you have smeared with whitewash. In other words, what good is the white paint going to do on the wall that comes under the judgment of God? You won't think about the whitewash. You won't think about the color of the paint on the walls inside of the, the Champlain Towers or in Haiti. And that's where the focus is of the people of God. Just make it look good. Make it appear to be okay. I will break down the wall that you have smeared with whitewash and bring it down to the ground so that its foundation will be laid bare. When it falls, you shall perish in the midst of it and you shall know that I am the Lord. 
Thus I will spend my wrath upon the wall and upon those who have smeared it with whitewash. And I will say to you, the wall is no more, nor those who smeared it, the prophets of Israel who prophesied concerning Jerusalem and saw visions of peace for her when there was no peace, declares the Lord God. God's prophet was saying, y'all, you need to repent. You need to change your ways. You are offending a holy God and he's putting up with your sin and he's putting up with you. He loves you, but he loves you and he's not gonna put up with your unholiness forever. And he's patient with you, he's not weak. And the false prophets were saying, don't listen to Jeremiah. Don't listen to Ezekiel. Oh, they're always trying to make you feel bad. This is how the Lord feels about those who try to just don't worry about it. New Testament warnings, read Matthew 24. We're not gonna read it here, but let John 3.36 summarize it. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. That's the wise builder. Whoever does not believe the Son, obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Judgment is coming, and judgment is only suspended by the hand of this God that so many people don't even know and hate. And he is holding them alive. So there's the wise builder, builds his life on Christ, the solid, solid rock. There's the foolish builder, he builds his life on the sinking sand of man's opinion. But the real question for each of us this morning is this, which builder am I? Weren't most of us taught the song? The wise man built his house upon the rock. Wise man built his. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. And the rains came tumbling down. Rains came down, floods came up, rains came down. And the house on the sand fell. And oh, how I would get into that as a kid. I know that's hard for you to believe. That would be animated and into songs. Flat. Probably got in trouble. Like, you're a pastor's kid. You're not supposed to be that emphasizing flat. I was into it. It's taught to us. Let me ask you, do you hear and obey the word of Christ? Or do you hear, do I hear and disobey the word of Christ? Which builder are you? You are one or the other. I am one or the other. There's a photo of Ramses II. Ozymandias. Look at the inscription that he had raised to this massive, I think this thing was about 57 feet high, this statue to himself out in the desert, middle of nowhere, middle of sand, miles and miles of desert. He reigned from 1279 to 1213. That would have been between the time of the Exodus and the reign of David in Israel, the United Kingdom. And this Ramses II erected this massive stature of himself out in the middle of the desert, and he said, here's what I want you to write on this statue. Okay, this guy was a powerful king, fathered somewhere around 200 children. Okay, my kingdom is going to live on. I'm going to make sure of it by having lots of descendants. And there's his statue. And this is what it says. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my mighty works, ye mighty, and despair. Beloved, that's what's left of him. I think God has a little bit of a sense of humor. Saying, you build on the sand, you build your life on you, do you have 200 children? Do you have that kind of a name, family name, and kingdom, and might, and power? He did. That's what's left of him. And judgment came to him. And judgment came to his statue. And that's all that's left. Which foundation are you building on? How do we embrace and live out this sermon? Are you want a few questions that we can be talking over this afternoon? Here's a question for you to discuss. Why is Jesus' parable of these two builders such a perfect conclusion to his sermon? 
Why is this such a perfect conclusion to a sermon? Two builders. Another question is this. Does my belief and worldview rely more upon reason, experience, tradition, or revelation? That one's going to take some time to unpack. What do I rely more upon? What I think, what I feel, my experiences, or book, chapter, and verse. And lastly, it all comes down to this. We heard the word of God. We heard the word of Christ today. So what in the world are we supposed to do? What's our next step in obedience? Don't we hear the word of God every week? Do I not ask you these questions every week? Do I not ask myself these questions every week? So what if we heard the message, what are we supposed to? Exactly. And once we clarify what it is we need to do, whether it's I need to turn from my sin and trust in Jesus, then do that. I need to make my, my salvation my profession public in the waters of baptism, then do that. I need to join a local church and be part of a local, visible New Testament family of God, then do that. I have a family member, neighbor, they don't know Christ and we're not guaranteed tomorrow. And I need to tell them in a loving and winsome way about a God who loves them and will save them, then do that all in the power and the grace that God supplies. Whatever it is that we need to do to obey Jesus, beloved, loved ones, let's do that. Let's stand together. Worship team, you come, and we're gonna sing this, this hymn, In Christ Alone, and then we're gonna be seated and we're gonna partake of communion together, and then we're gonna give to the Lord because he's given so much for us and we respond in worship in this way. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for a Savior who loves and died so that he can forgive and he reigns and all who are in Christ, we will reign with him. Oh, thank you for the salvation that you have offered. I thank you for the comfort that we find in your word from the Apostle Peter that he's, as he thinks about the loved ones in the churches that he's writing to. And he says, And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, and strengthen and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Thank you again for listening to Teaching from the Word at Grace Community Church. We are located in Richmond, Michigan. You can find us online at mygracechurch.com. Please subscribe and follow us at My Grace Church. It would be greatly appreciated if you would take a moment to rate, like, and share this message. We want you to always remember that you are loved.